you for leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting and a provocative start. Our next speaker is James Compton. James teaches in both our undergraduate MIT program and our graduate media studies program, as well as the journalism program. So he does just about everything. His research addresses both political economy and the political economy of news and popular culture. James Compton. Okay, thanks, Edward. Um, a lot of the comments that uh, Edward had off the top that up, but I have to say, I think. Um, it's true, I think, that at first blush, the concept of the prosumer presents itself as a fundamental challenge to a long history of critical media studies research, primarily, which can be, you know, if I can crunch it down into a line or two, it essentially has been about uh, a critique of mass media as being uh, unidirectional, monological, a one-way mass production. Um, this one-way monological production that is kind of force-fed to the masses, as they say, uh, and that the reception of these messages is passive. And so there's a long critique, uh, both from a conservative and from a radical perspective, that the lack of active participation in media production and consumption is a fundamental problem. And so, um, it would appear at first blush that bloggers, Facebook, MySpace have revolutionized the media system and have turned it on its head. And in fact, uh, when I read uh, Advertising Age, which I read regularly, when I read uh, the business pages of the Globe and Mail and the Wall Street Journal, I see this narrative repeated over and over and over again. And they point uh, to empirical evidence uh, of people producing, uh, and they are, right? Uh, and so um, the question I, I, so I think it, what you have to ask though, is it really true, right? And so, you know, and what's my method to think about that? I have not done any research on the prosumer. Uh, <coughs> but uh, I plan to do something. Uh, I've had a long time uh, been thinking about debunking uh, the phrase Web 2.0, but um, which drives me nuts. But maybe I'll explain you know, why that does a bit uh, in the course of today. Um, so what I do, what's my method about kind of answering whether or not this is true? Edwards asked us to talk about our method. Well, my method is critical political economy, which can, is a broad phrase, but um, essentially what I do is I take the object of study, whatever it may be, so we'll say prosumer here, and I refer it back to the broader social totality. That's a one line. You know, what the hell does that mean? Well, it means taking whatever it is that you're studying and relating it back to various aspects of social life economic, political, cultural, uh, and uh, trying to understand the historical context in which that phenomena has been produced and is you know, trying to realize itself, if you will. So um, a lot of what I do, I think, can be summarized. My work is in uh, news media, more strictly, but it's really political economy, political communication, uh, and also uh, which melds very heavily with kind of the histories of consumer culture because uh, I see the two as being coextensive. Um, and w a lot of what I have done in a journalism context is to try to debunk certain myths. You know, uh, the myth of convergence, as I've called it. The myth of objectivity, news objectivity, a number of things. Uh, and there's a myth also associated with uh, the introduction of new technologies. That is, uh, if you look back historically, every time a new technology is introduced, there, it's shadowed by a promotional discourse. Uh, it happened with elect uh, electricity, it happened with the telegraph, it happened with the newspaper, it happened with radio, it happened with TV, it happened with cable, it's happened with the internet. Now, every time. And so, and every time uh, 
the boosters will say that there has been a revolutionary change and the masses are now in control. Now, it's not to say that there have not been democratic advancements associated with these technologies and we can point to them. Right? But there is a hype associated uh, with that, a promotional hype, which I would say reifies the object and takes it out of the complexity of its historical context and the way in which these technologies are used and by whom, to what purpose. Those, you know, that's the type of thing you need to do. And as critical uh, media scholars, that's what we do. We have a range of approaches in this program. Uh, I have, this is my way of doing it. So uh, the historical approach, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that phenomena, whatever it is that you're looking at, cannot be understood independently from the history in which they find themselves. That is to say, phenomena do not present themselves naturally. They are not just, it, uh, although we often are told that they just are, a lot of what I do is to challenge that positivity, as critical scholars like to talk about that. Um, Guy Debord has a great line, he's got many, you know, the spectacle presents itself as an enormous positivity. All it says is, uh, all that is good will appear, and all that appears is good. <laughs> um, that, in a way, sums up uh, what I'm, I'm trying to kind of, if you try to historicize uh, the object of study, like the prosumer, or, you know, that will kind of complicate the naturalization of, of phenomena, historicize it. Uh, as the gang of four saying, you know, natural's not in it. <laughs> Each day seems like a natural fact, but what we think changes how we act, act, act. Uh, but those are <laughs> gang of four fans will know the reference. Um, so, uh, what's the historical context of the prosumer? Uh, well, so going back to Toppler, um, I didn't realize until I kind of started to look into this, that Toppler coined the phrase. Uh, that was new to me. Uh, but so the prosumer is associated with these three waves that he talks about. The first wave uh, prior to industrial society where people, communities, produced uh, for their own use and consumption. Uh, they were not exchanging. In an industrialized society, things are produced for exchange and that that's called capitalism, and there's a fundamental change in social relations that occurs as a result of that. In the third wave, we're said to be returning back to a kind of prosumption, a production for use. Um, and keep in mind, as Edward said, this was the 1970s when he wrote this, so you know he wasn't thinking about the internet and blogging or anything like that. But what he was talking about was the uh, extension of everyday life and leisure time, in and the kind of co-extension of that in, in with production time, uh, I believe. And certainly uh, that is the, uh, so, you know, that you can be producing in the leisure time for yourself um, as you consume. I don't know, a kind of a rough example, you know, buying an IKEA table that you can't figure out how to, you know, you, you're using your leisure time and you're producing as you consume. That would be one kind of an extension of that. Um, now, I think it's important to point out that, um, how much time do I have? Oh, only a few more, oh dear. Okay, well, my students will know that I often have this problem, right? That is to say, I have much more to say than, than time allotted. So, um, Marx points out in the Grundrisse that production is always related to consumption. One assumes the other. So it is not new at all to say that something called prosumption is this revelatory event that the internet has ushered in. In fact, it's part, it's at the core of capitalist social relations. In Fordist culture, uh, the very fact that you're going to mass produce a lot of goods meant that you had to have people uh, willing to mass consume them. You had to stimulate that consumption. And uh, post-war marketing and advertising industry uh, grows enormously as a result of that need to link produ production and consumption. So they've always been related. Um, 
And so the question is not, is not, I think, do people produce and consume at the same time in, the, in that uh, leisure time and everyday life are linked? They are. Uh, the question is, to what extent is that activity autonomous or not? In, in what way are people in control of their own production and consumption? Uh, now, so do they produce commodities for their own social use according to a logic that they uh, conceive of collectively or individually and that they are in control of? Or is it according to uh, a social logic that is provided for them? Um, uh, Marx uh, has talked about the process of reivocation, that is the, the process by which everyday life is subject to forms of, of rationalization and order and control. And uh, my own research has looked at this in the context of the production of media spectacles at both the macro and micro level. But I think you can also take that analysis and apply it to prosumption as a way of kind of ask as a basic question, to what extent are blogs uh, or MySpace users or Facebook users acting uh, and producing for their own use, or are they acting uh, uh, in a way that is uh, a part of a reified process? That is to say, um, have they escaped exchange value? Is another way of thinking about it. Uh, are, or is their pr uh, production for consumption an extension of that activity? Uh, that's a basic question that I would start to ask. Um, I know that sounds a little abstract. Um, I was showing this beginning of a documentary yesterday in my uh, 302 course, uh, and it struck, it was about uh, Paris Hilton, Inc. And it's about the, uh, the production of branded self, that she is the, kind of, she's perfected it in a way, right? That she has entered into the, her own, and, the, into the production process itself, and that she gives the media exactly what they need and want. And as a result, the production of her brand expands. Um, you know, she is fully acting within a promotional logic that is fully enveloped in exchange value. Um, I, I gather I have my time's running up. So, um, yes. Uh, so I ask yourself. Um, I'll, I'll end with this quip. When Obama girl uh, creates her video and dances about uh, in a strapless whatever, uh, singing how she loves B Barack Obama, is that an example of a democratic breakthrough? Uh, or is she uh, acting according to a logic that's not her own? <laughs>